wonderful. So now we move on and we're going to have, we have the pleasure of having yet another great uh, keynote where we're also hopefully going to have some time for questions. And this time we are going to be listening to Dr. Rosa Balfour. Uh, so welcome, um, uh, Dr. Balfour. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Dr. Balfour is the director of Carnegie Europe. And as you know, Carnegie Europe is one of the uh, consortium members in this Engage project. And we're delighted to be able to cooperate with, with, with them. Um, a very quick uh, introduction to um, Dr. Balfour. She's a PhD from London School of Economics with a master's and bachelor from Cambridge. She has been very active in thinking and writing about um, Europe and, and, and European international relations. And uh, she has been always in this space of the think tank world where she has combined rigorous research with applied uh, learnings and policy implications. So without further ado, thank you very much, Dr. Balfour, to be here with us. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, congratulations on the start of the project. Um, what I'd like to do with you today is share a few thoughts on three issues, democracy, authoritarianism, and declinism, and then think through some implications for Europe and what this means for the EU in particular. I'm going to take um, advantage of the uh, tail end of Biden's trip to Europe, where he's met G7 leaders, NATO leaders, EU leaders, and now is in Geneva to meet um, Putin. Ahead of this um, trip, which is his first uh, foreign trip, um, Biden elaborated pretty clearly his vision of global politics in an op-ed for the Washington Post, which I'm sure most of you have uh, read. Um, and he sees uh, world politics really as, as evolving as a contest between democracy and authoritarianism. And this is pretty logical consequence of all that we've seen coming out of the Biden administration about their, their world view, um, which all the members of the Biden administration have really been communicating to the rest of the world with great intellectual rigor and discipline. And that is that the US needs to better equip itself domestically to fight the rising competition uh, with China and that the US wants to address all international issues together with its partners and allies, and that the US wants to improve its role in international institutions and global government governance. Um, but this framing about democracy versus authoritarianism um, is, is very interesting, but I think it also needs to be accompanied by another trend, which is this trend of um, decline. I think if you look at these three themes together, which I'll try to do, albeit briefly, we can we can um, shed some light on several contextual developments about international relations. And one is um, what the nexus between internal uh, politics and external politics actually means in real concrete terms. Um, the role of narratives, of propaganda, of um, persuasion, the value of persuasion, which I think has acquired an additional currency um, in recent years, and also the shifting um, relationships and alliances. And all these implications, I think, are relevant to looking then at Europe's role. So while I'll try to be brief about my first uh, few points, um, I'll try to elaborate a little bit more, perhaps, on the EU. So let's start with the state of global democracy. And the story of the past decade, of, if not more, is of a story of crisis. Um, since about 2006, we have seen four trends that have taken shape. First of all, the number of countries backsliding from democracy has increased through coups, through relentless degradation of uh, democratic features. And this happened after this sort of optimistic wave post-Cold War, during which electoral the numbers of electoral democracies uh, grew. Secondly, the quality of democracy has declined in important states around the world, and these states are also setting regional trends, so there's spillover effects um, in other countries, and they have declined through bad governance, through corruption, through the abuse of democratic institutions. And thirdly, 
um, democracy has been performing badly in the Western world. Um, and it, it is the Western world and the promotion of democracy, which in, enables an environment after the end of the Cold War in which ex democracy exp expanded. Um, but actually, according to specialists, and I'm quoting Inglehart, one of the greatest um, uh, analysts on this topic, um, in, since the 2010s, the world is experiencing the most severe democratic setbacks since um, fascism. And this, of course, re refers to Europe as well. We know the notorious cases of Poland and Hungary that we keep on uh, repeating, but there are other more surreptitious ways in which the quality of democracy has been uh, backsliding in, in advanced democracies. Uh, for instance, through civil society, in civil society, attacks on civil society, or civil liberties in the media, media freedom, the level of the levels of um, corruptions, um, the relationships between executives and, and the opposition. So there are a number of counts in which we can see this decline of democracy, and this is happening within. The fourth trend is the authoritarian trend. Um, and we can see that authoritarianism has been considerably strengthened in countries such as Russia, China, Turkey, e Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Um, and this, there's been, you know, a global wave of autocratization, which means that one third of the world's population actually does not live in a democracy. But I think what's particularly relevant to Biden's uh, approach to global politics is the fact that authoritarianism is not limited to the internal affairs of authoritarian states or, or to uh, um, autocracies and their spheres of influence, but they're actually encroaching far more aggressively on democracies through disinformation, through transnational um, repression, through cyber interference. So it just leads one to think about, you know, Clausewitz, the famous quotation about war as a continuation of politics through other means. Well, today, experts are, are viewing disinformation as a form of where, uh, warfare. We're also seeing that, the, that Crimea was not an isolated episode. Have Crimea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Belarus repeated infringements on international law and rules, rules of the game. Um, uh, and, and, and this is it's not, it's not just an exception that happened in 2014, it is continuing. Um, we're also seeing that authoritarian leaders are borrowing each other's playbook when one um, method to crack, crack down on, for instance, foreign funded NGOs works in one country, another country copies the, the, the rules, the, the, the legislative proposals and implements them in their own country. So these are the four trends that are distinguishing uh, the, the, you know, the global trajectory, which are clearly informing the way in which Biden and his team see uh, the world. But I'd like to add this third element of declinism, um, which is used as a justification for the broken model of democracy. And there are two dimensions to declinism. One is tied to the West and its decline, and the other is tied to the narratives that are promoted by authoritarianism. Now, we know that the, the West has been in decline um, for, for several years now, in decline as an economic powerhouse, as a global re leader. We just had the G7 meeting. Well, G7 countries represent just 10% of the world population, a declining share of the global economy, but they still represent a large portion of the world's wealth. So this feeds into narratives about inequalities and Western uh, hegemony. And of course, Asia and China in particular have seen exponential economic growth and China is exporting its de developmental model abroad. So there's nothing new in this. Um, but we're also seeing the concept of the West being and the concept of the West in decline being challenged internally. On the one hand, there's a rise of populism, which is contributing to the democratic recession within the West, but it's also contributing to a declinist uh, rhetoric globally. If the West cannot fix its own problems, how can it address the world's problems? And the nationalist populist solution to this would entail a retreat, the West's retreat from the global arena. There are also progressives who look at the democratic recession with worry and argue that we need to address democratic reform before engaging with global politics. So here too, the nexus between what's happening internally and the next and what's happening externally is very evident. 
And indeed, you know, we, a couple of years ago, the Munich Security Conference came out with this big report about the Westlessness, the end of the of the West, that Biden is clearly trying to put together again. Now, this dimension of decline, there's another dimension of decline, which I think I'd like to <clears throat> um, uh, bring out. We've all been reading about it in, in the press, but it is actually pretty recent. Um, we know that China and Russia, for obvious reasons, relish the multipolar uh, world, but they've also progressively supported strategies that undermine the West's internal resilience, the domestic resilience, and they're increasingly assertive in their critique of the West. Um, um, just when uh, the US and, the, and China, they had a first meeting in Alaska, the Chinese foreign ministry replied uh, to US criticism of human rights, um, saying that the horrors such as the Atlantic slave trade, colonialism, the Holocaust, and the deaths of so many Americans from COVID-19 should make Western governments ashamed to question China's record on human rights. So they're, you know, pointing their fingers at all the um, historic and contemporary uh, problems in Western societies to put a shield, to argue in favor of a shield from any kind of criticism. And beneath, behind this, um, this, this narrative is a conviction, according to China observers, that China is on the rise and the West and America in particular is in inevitable decline. Um, Russia too um, has been long engaging or, or promoting its own patriarchal uh, model of society, arguing that the liberal West is morally bankrupt. Uh, it's not just a question of power, it's actually morally bankrupt. So they've been much more assertive in proposing alternatives um, to uh, the liberal idea that the West has been uh, proposing in, during the past uh, 70 years. So what are the implications of these trends for um, international relations. What do these three trends, democracy, authoritarian, um, authoritarianism and declinism, tell us about IR? And I'll be very brief because I can see time is running out. I think the first point is that they really are an illustration of the degree to which internal politics and external dynamics are interconnected. Um, the build back, build back better rhetoric that has been embraced by the US and by the EU, um, you know, as, as a sort of post-COVID vision of the world, um, really does um, um, require a, a simultaneous approach to domestic politics and to external policy. And again, we've seen, you know, the question of global leadership on the vaccine drive come up um, at the G7, although the response was a bit um, short on the ambition and on the needs, um, especially of the global south, to fight uh, the coronavirus pandemic. But the, the Biden administration is clearly saying, we know we have a problem of democracy, we're going to address it, but we're also, we're not going to shy away from international engagement at the same time. The second thing it shows, and that, again, we know this, is that narratives are important. Um, this is because of social media, this is because of the technological revolution, what is said in a small town in one country can easily be uh, picked up across on the other side of, of the globe and increasingly these you know the, there's greater public awareness about international politics about international relationships so they're playing into both uh, spheres and finally I think Biden's um, Biden's um, view of the world says a lot about values and global values, but it also says a lot about power and how power is shifting. And what we're seeing is a recognition that the US alone cannot address all the problems of the world, that the transatlantic relationship alone cannot address all the problems of the world. And therefore, there's a greater focus on forging alliances, partnerships, um, ad hoc relationships even, with a greater number of countries across the globe. And I would say the EU is also doing this, perhaps it's trumpeting it less, but it is actually trying to see how to engage with other parts of the world in constructive ways. Now, in light of this, these sort of three global shifts and the implications for international relations, what does this mean for the EU? I'll um, focus on 
three or four points, but I'll do it very briefly again, conscious of the time, happy to engage more in the discussion. Um, the first point I'd like to make is about the EU and international democracy and the problems it has. Because the EU over the past decades, actually, the past 30 years or so, has been refining, strengthening its toolbox. And the latest is the sanctions package that was agreed upon um, last, uh, la at the end of last year, um, which is you know, considered a sort of equivalent of the Magnitsky Act. But it's not a policy, it's a set of tools that can be used um, if, there, if, you know, if the occasion came up, and it has come up, we've seen sanctions against China coordinated with the US, with the UK, with Canada, um, but it's not, it doesn't represent a policy towards China, it just represents one toolbox that can be used with respect to human rights around the globe. So, but while the EU has strengthened the toolbox, the rhetoric has actually gone in another direction. Two decades ago, the EU was the champion of norm normative power, of global norms, of human rights and democracy. Today, the language has changed considerably. We had in the EU global strategy, the reference to principled pragmatism. And we have today with this commission, we have the rhetoric of you know, geopolitical commission, the, rest, the language of power. So paradoxically, while the transatlantic relationship seems to be getting better compared to the Trump years, the trajectory on international democracy seems to go in a different direction, certainly in terms of narratives. And then we have the uh, often quoted problem of democ democratic backsliding within the EU, which has an, a reputational impact, it damages EU credibility internationally, but it's also affecting the use of decision-making capacity. Um, and we're seeing this a lot on human rights issues, but not only. Um, what does this mean with respect to security and defense, which is the subject of the, few, the next uh, couple of panels uh, that you will be um, discussing? And I think in terms of general trends, the EU is going in a similar direction. It's sharpening the toolbox. It's taking a step-by-step -step approach to improving its capacity in security and defense with PESCO, with the strategic compass. But what the actual purpose of all this is, it is, is still a little bit um, misty. Um, it's not entirely sure what type of security uh, and defence engagements the EU is willing to go. We know from the NATO-EU summit that NATO-EU cooperation is one steady path for, for, for improvement, but we're not entirely sure um, where the EU wants to go. And I refer here back to Solana's point about the need for, need for crisis management at out of, out of area. Um, the EU has been very reluctant to engage in these types of activities over the past few years. So, so we need to see where that's going to go. Um, there, there's a big debate behind this, and that is the debate on strategic autonomy. Um, I think I'll limit my comments just to two, identifying two dilemmas. One is the sense of belonging. Where is, where does the EU see itself in terms of strategic autonomy? Does it see it in a relationship, EU, NATO, the US, the West, or um, is it engaging, is it thinking more of ad hoc relationships um, with you know other countries um, in order to uh, uh, in order to affirm its um, autonomy precisely from traditional relationships, and I think the second dilemma is one uh, between self reliance and openness to the rest of the world. Um, again, it ref it, it's it's connected to the first dilemma that I mentioned, uh, but I think that there is there are challenges as to um, what it is that the EU wants to do, how it wants to pursue them. Is it going to be defensive and protective about its interests or is, is it going to present itself to the world with a certain degree of openness? And we know that um, there's also calls for openness, especially on the trade front. Um, and there, there's a whole discussion around this, um, which goes well beyond the security and defence discussion. It's also about the economy, in, in industrial strategy, supply chains, trade, etc. Uh, so I think these are the two big dilemmas uh, in which the strategic autonomy uh, debate is, is, is nested. My final comment is, and here I'll end, is about democracy versus authoritarianism. So Biden's message to the rest of the world. And we know that the EU and many of its member states are uncomfortable with this type of framing. 
Um, also because, as Solana said earlier, um, um, there is a strong trend within the EU, uh, a strong preference within the EU to avoid confrontation with China and also with Russia. But I think there's one point of contact between the EU and the US. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the US's commitment to multilateralism, which will last this administration. It might not last beyond this, regardless of who's elected, because the US has a, uh, doesn't have a long history or it doesn't have the same history as the EU of commitment to multilateralism. It's not necessarily the US's end goal. Um, but I think with the US support, current uh, administration support for multilateralism and, and a rules-based order, I think there's a point of contact in looking at how authoritarianism is breaking those rules, is breaking international law and what uh, the EU and the US can do together in order to, to address that. Um, the um, end goals of the EU and the US in this particular case might be slightly different. As I said, the EU continues to be committed to multilateralism. It's a kind of existential commitment. It's what keeps the EU afloat. Um, but um, if the world is going to be framed in these authoritarianism versus democracy, terms which the EU is not necessarily happy with, or maybe seeking points of contact with allies around the question of international rules and international law, that could be a way forward. And it could also provide a vision for how the EU needs to proceed in international relations um, at this particular moment in history. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for those introductory uh remarks full of uh, full of uh, ideas and, and and analysis so uh, perhaps a couple of questions to get started or, or just one um, does the EU have so how much maneuver maneuverability or agency does the EU have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US when it tries to think it's its place in the world and in particular in this relationship between uh, China and, and, and the US or the authoritarianism and democracy. So if Biden really, President Biden really plays um, its hand strongly and, 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 and tries to engage with Europe, does Europe have capacity to moderate uh, uh, the, its role? Well, I've actually been quite struck at how disciplined Europeans have been ahead of this EU-US summit. They've been disciplined in the sense they've been united and they've been um, uh, uh, they've also been proactively pushing for an agenda. There's a whole host of issues around which the US and the EU do not agree. Um, I think this current administration has conveyed repeatedly that they're not seeking uh, flat alignment on a US position. They're willing to engage. But I think this US administration, I mean, it's it's perhaps, you know, it's probably not accurate to say this, but this US administration is much more concerned about domestic politics and making sure that whatever international decisions it's ma it makes, it will not face a domestic rebellion because they need to repair um, the, the, the American society because of the polarization of the past few years. Well, the EU in many respects is, is similar. The EU has all these domestic constraints and problems in reaching a decision. Remember the, the agreement with Canada? It had to go through a whole set of um, domestic, shall we say, internal politics procedures because the, 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 the agreement was contested by the regional assembly of one member state. So, so I think in a way they're, they're similar. Huh? They, they're in a similar, in a similar position. And so um, in, in terms of domestic constraints to what do they can do it, it internationally, which means that the negotiation between the two sides as to what they're going to do together is going to be more complicated. But the important thing is that they've opened the channel of dialogue and they've provided the space to do that. And I think what we'll, what we'll have to see is some trade-offs. And that, that's why it's important to have those, those spaces um, for dialogue. I do think the EU has room for maneuver. This is not a unilateral American moment, um, but this is a moment in which a lot is at stake in terms of what we knew of the past and what may come in the future. And I think for the EU, an, an, a, a reform and a, an, an improvement of what we knew in the past is, is in its interest, more so than a world 
dominated by China, Russia, etc. It would give more predictability. It would give the EU more room for for, for manoeuvre. Um, so I think yes, the EU does have space for manoeuvre vis-a-vis the US, um, and it also does vis-a-vis other countries with which the EU is deeply integrated economically, etc., or energy-wise, etc. Uh, but it really is a question of what is the EU's vision within this within this. Um, you know, it's not the EU hasn't come up with a world view. The US has and China has. So the EU needs to kind of, you know, mold its space within those constraints and decide, you know, what does it prefer? Thank you. Thank you. So we're receiving some more questions. Luke Dockendorf compliments you for your excellent uh, keynote and, 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 and poses a question related to what we were just talking, uh, but perhaps slightly different and, and, and related to your comment about Biden trying to recover from the Westlessness or, mm. or trying to rebuild the West. How do you imagine the new West? Uh, is that just simply a reconfiguration uh, of the or a reenactment of the status quo, or are we seeing something different in or you envision something different in that new West? I mean, we need to see something different because the old world, you know, the the decline of the West is real. It's not just invented by by uh, by the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, um, and um, and. And we also need to be self-critical about the weaknesses of the old West. And I think the biggest weakness was the lack of inclusivity with the rest of the world, the asymmetry between the West and and the global South, um, which is the challenge at the moment. So I think where, uh, and that's, I think, where we see a bit of a failure. So, you know, of the G7, for instance. So, you know, Biden came with this idea of reconfiguring the West, somewhat enlarged because of the invitation to for um, other countries, many of which, I mean, you know, Australia was always considered the old West anyway, um, but um, but not uh, not necessarily um, um, India. But um, I think the point is um, we need to be more inclusive. We need to think about uh, reform and you know maybe over, get get over the idea of the old West. This is a different phase, uh, but I think the values and the principles of the old West are. Um, uh, will resonate uh, more than the authoritarian, patriarchal, um, techno-surveillance values that are being put forward by these alternative views of global politics. And I think that's really the conversation that needs to be had. It has to be on how can we form, um, you know, a, a broader, more diverse set of alliances that is going to be in the interest of other countries and not just of the old West. How can we make the world less hegemonic, which means, you know, reform the institutions and to give greater voice uh, to others. Um, and the starting point of that has to be addressing uh, the vaccine drive in the global South. And here the G7 has really fallen short of ambition. Uh, the Economist came out with a title just before the G7 actually met saying, you know, this is going to be the greatest lost opportunity. And I, I think it's true. So, you know, the limits to even how, you know, the framing of the Biden administration, which has a lot of, uh, which is, you know, in many respects is compelling in terms of analysis, but, you know, in terms of um, uh, decisions made, uh, the vaccine drive simply is, the commit they have committed to simply is not enough. And they're all the underlying problems um, of uh, manufacturing capacity, of access to pharmaceutical companies and patents, etc. All these underlying problems haven't really been addressed. Um, so, but the international institutions are looking at these a lot more. WTO, IMF are coming up with much more radical visions than in the past. So, so I think things are changing. Wonderful. Um, so uh, perhaps one last question. Uh... Question. So this duality we are talking, you're talking about democracy, authoritarianism, uh, which is Biden's worldview. Is this just a President Biden's and the U.S. worldview, or do you think we are already in a dual world? There are a lot of, I mean, you know, democracy versus authoritarianism is is um, you know from a point of view of an analysis. I mean, if you look at um, what is a democracy and what is an authoritarian regime, you've got a lot of shades of greys in between. You've got a lot of diversity in types of democracies and types of 
authoritarianism. So, you know, if I, as a political scientist, you know, with someone with a political science background, I cannot endorse it in those, um, in those black and white terms. But I do think the two notions are shaping the, the globe in, in ways that are perhaps more um, determining and have greater impacts than in the past. Um, so, you know, what I would like to refrain from is embracing sort of Cold War 2.0 type of logic. Um, you know, it used to be communism versus liberal democracy. And now we have, you know, authoritarianism versus democracy. It, it's not it's not that simple. Um, and I also think we need to recognize that and the, the US in particular needs to perhaps recognize this more in greater depth. And, you know, I think they've acknowledged it, but maybe it's a bit superficial, that a lot of democratic countries are really struggling, especially if they're in proximity of authoritarian states. Um, so it's very hard to disentangle their relationships. The, these black and white choices, which is the way, you know, Trump used to frame it, simply don't work for countries that are not superpowers. So we need to be much more nuanced in the way we, we, we understand this. Uh, but I do think we can, I do think it's, it's, you know, a useful summary as to where global politics are going precisely. And I think the big change is the fact that democracy is in decline and that authoritarianism is much more aggressive in its external projection. It's not just its internal um, repression. Wonderful. So thank you very much, Dr. Balfour, for your time, your thought your thoughts uh, and it's a pleasure to be uh, with you in this project and um, and again thank you for your very valuable time thanks thank you very much bye 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 thank you